What's up, guys? Thank you for joining us. Um, this is going to be our last message in the book of Job um, as we're wrapping up this series and we're wrapping up our couple of few, last six weeks, I guess, of reading in the book of Job. I hope that you've gotten a lot out of it. I know that I have. I just want to give you a quick recap before we jump into it. Um, so starting in week one, we talked about we talked about why Christians go through suffering. Week two, we talked about the Christian response to suffering. Week three, we talked about if our suffering will ever end as Christians, and what we came to realize is that it will. Week four, we talked about um, how Jesus responded to suffering. And week last week, week five, last week, whatever, we talked about this really weird interlude that Job threw in about wisdom. And then this week, we're wrapping it all up, putting a nice little bow on the book of Job. And, you know, we've been looking at a lot of different thoughts, right? We've looked at a lot of different thoughts that we've had during suffering. Um, and I've done that and I've, I've made sure that we talked about that so that when you do go through suffering or maybe you're in a suffering right now, you can identify those things. I want to identify just one more thought. And that's the thought of being able to do better than God. Thinking that I can do better than God and I know better than you. And what we see in Job's final defense in chapters 29 through 31 is Job saying in essence exactly that. Listen to just a couple of scriptures from the, that defense that he gives. Job chapter 29 starting in verse 14. We talked about this one on the Instagram. He says, I clothed myself in righteousness and it enveloped me. My just decisions were like a robe and a turban. I was eyes to the blind and feet to the lame. I was a father to the needy, and I examined the case of the stranger. I shattered the fangs of the unjust and snatched the prey from his teeth. So Job's saying, I'm righteous, right? He's saying, I'm, I'm clothed in righteousness. My righteousness and justice enveloped me. He's saying, I'm righteous, so I don't deserve the suffering that I'm going through. Looking one chapter over, starting in verse 20, at Job chapter 30, he says, I cry out to you for help, but you don't answer me. When I stand up, you merely look at me. You've turned against me with cruelty. You harass me with your strong hand. You lift me up on the wind and make me ride it. You scatter me in the storm. Yes, I know that you will lead me to death, the place appointed for all who live. He's saying that God is not just, that God is not right, that there is nothing good about God in this moment. Job chapter 31, verse 4, Job says, Does he not see my ways and number all my steps? Job is in essence asking God, Do you know what you're doing? He says, Do you know what you're doing? Because if you did, you would know that I don't deserve this. And all throughout 31, he's saying that he doesn't deserve it. He goes on these if-then statement craze. He says that if I've done wrong, then you can punish me, but I know that I haven't. If we wrapped and summed all of that up, he would say, I can do better than you, God, because I'm going through this suffering right now and I know that I don't deserve this. I think you and I kind of know what Job is feeling, right? When, when we go through a suffering, when something doesn't go the way that you and I wanted to, we question God. We kind of get mad at him and we wonder why is this happening? And just like in any intelligent conversation, when we question God, we need to be prepared for him to question us back. And I believe that there are two questions that God wants to ask each and every one of us in response to whatever question we bring to him, whatever way that we interrogate him. And I want to look to his response to Job, starting in, verse, or starting in chapter 38. So 38 through 42, God is just responding to all that Job has said. And really responding a lot to the, the, um, the defense that he's made in 29 through 31. So I want to start in Job chapter 38. So go ahead and flip there. And we're going to start in verse 4. Okay, let me go ahead and read that. Job 38 starting in verse 4. God says, Where were you when I established the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who fixed its dimensions? Certainly you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? What supports its foundations or who laid its cornerstone while the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Who enclosed the sea behind doors when it burst from the womb? When I made the cloud its garment and thick darkness its blanket? When I determined its boundaries and put its bars and doors in place? When I declared you may come this far but no farther, your proud waves stop here? Have you ever in your life commanded the morning or assigned the dawn its place so it may seize the edges of the earth and shake the wicked out of it? The earth is changed as clay is by a seal. 
Its hills stand out like the folds of a garment. Light is withheld from the wicked, and the arm raised in violence is broken. Have you traveled to the sources of the sea or walked in the depths of the oceans? Have the gates of death been revealed to you? Have you seen the gates of deep darkness? Have you comprehended the extent of the earth? Tell me if you know all this. Where is the road to the home of light? Do you know where darkness lives so you can lead it back to its border? Are you familiar with its paths to home? Don't you know? You were already born. You have lived so long. I know there's a lot of scripture and a lot of different questions are being asked there, but we can sum it up into one question. And that one question that God is asking is, do you think that you know better than me? From chapter 38, really in 39 even, we can take the question away, do you think that you know better than me? And I think in that moment, right, when we are passionate about whatever it is that we're going through, and God asks us the question, do you think you know better than me? I think a lot of us would say, yeah, I think I do. Because I asked you to do this thing, but you didn't do it. And, and that's basically what Job is saying, right? God knows that that is Job's response to that question based on his defense. And just the questions that God gives to Job, the vibe check that he gives to Job, right? He says, okay, if you know better than me, what's at the bottom of the ocean? If you know better than me, Tell me how I created this very intelligent world all around you. If you know better than me, tell me where to find darkness and light. Where's the source of it? If you know better than me, tell me what I already know. And in that moment, what God is doing is giving Job this reality check, this vibe check, right, is the word that we use now, to help remind him who God is. And you know, sometimes when we're, when we're in these places where we ask God to do something and he doesn't do it, or God does something that doesn't make any sense to us, we need that reminder, right? Because we tend to think about who God is based on how we feel in that moment, rather than what the facts say in God's word. God wants you to remember who he is. He's not just doing this to be harsh, He's doing this because he wants you to remember who he is. His holiness, his perfection, his righteousness and justice. Listen to the response that Job gives. Look at chapter 40, verse 1. The Lord answered Job, Will the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? Let him who argues with God give an answer. Then Job answered the Lord, I am so insignificant. How can I answer you? I place my hand over my mouth. I have spoken once and I will not reply twice, but now I can add nothing. God wants you and I in our sufferings to remember who he truly is. Because the enemy is going to be trying to convince you and I that he's this terrible person. That he is not right, that he is not good, that he is not just, that he is not holy or perfect. And God is willing to go to whatever extent, even hurting our feelings, in order to open our eyes to who he truly is, so that we would remember who he truly is. God wants us to know who he is, but there's also another question that he wants to ask. So I believe God asks us two questions. I think the first question is, do you think you know better than me? Now I want to look at that second question. Look at verse 8 of chapter 40. God says, would you really challenge my justice? Would you declare me guilty to justify yourself? Do you have an arm like God's? Can you thunder with a voice like his? Adorn yourself with majesty and splendor and clothe yourself with honor and glory. Unleash your raging anger. Look on every proud person and humiliate him. Look on every proud person and humble him. Trample the wicked where they stand. Hide them together in the dust. Imprison them in the grave. Then I will confess to you that your own right hand can deliver you. I think the second question God wants to ask you and I is, do you think your ways are better than mine? Do you think that your ways are better than mine? And again, I think in that passionate moment, we would say, yeah. Because we had these plans, right? We had this plan figured out as to how this situation was going to go. And we had it all figured out. We thought we had every route covered. And even if it didn't turn out like like we wanted it to, we had a plan B, right? And plan B was going to be not as great, but we were still okay if it happened, right? We planned for it. And then God goes and does something completely different. 
And we're like, God, why didn't you just do it the way that I asked you to? God, why didn't you just save the person that I was asking you to save from that sickness? God, why didn't you just fix my parents' marriage? God, why didn't you just let that boy like me? God, why didn't you just give me a better grade? And when we say that, we're claiming, God, why didn't you do this the way I wanted you to? Because I think my way is better. And God's saying, okay, if you think that your way is better, if you think that your thoughts are better than mine, and you think your ways are better than mine, that means you're, you're equating yourself with me. That's what God's saying. He thinks that we're equating ourselves with him, that we would say and state for ourselves that we're God. So he's saying, okay, if you're God, then prove it. Reverse time. And in, these, in this 8 through 14 of chapter 20, he's saying reverse time to the situation that you're complaining to me about. Fix it in the way that you want it to, into the way you wanted it to go, and then come back to the present moment and see the way that it worked out. And immediately we should say, I can't do that. It's because we can't. We cannot reverse time and go fix the things that God has already done. God not only wants us to remember who he is, he wants us to remember who we are in light of that. Not God. Nowhere close. So our ways are not as good as God's. And our thoughts are not as good as God's. And this brings us to Isaiah 55. Listen to verses 8 and 9. God says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, and your ways are not my ways, declares the Lord. For as heaven is higher than earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. You see, we, we, we complain to God, and we, we get mad at God when he doesn't do what we want him to. But have you ever stopped and wondered why God wouldn't allow your thing to happen? Why God didn't allow it to happen the way you wanted it to? You might think, well, God's just a big bully, or there's some weird lesson God's trying to teach me, whatever. Maybe God wants what's best for you. And what you fail to consider, and what I fail to consider all the time, is that his best plans come nowhere close to mine. That his best plan is so far greater than mine. And everything he does is so much better than mine. And the reason that it's so much better than mine because his plans aren't plagued by sin. You see, I am a sinful being. We all are sinful beings. There is no one righteous, no, not one. Everyone has fallen short of the glory of God. We have gone against what the word of God tells us. And because of that, our thoughts are not as pure as they should be. Our ways are not as good as we think they are. We get tempted to believe that the way that we want to do things is the best. But in reality, the truth is that what we think is best is plagued by sin. What we think is best is sinful. What God thinks is best is. Because he is not sin. He has no sin. There is no unrighteousness in him. Look at Job chapter 42. Look at Job's response to this understanding of his sin. Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do anything, and no plan of yours can be thwarted. You asked, who is this who conceals my counsel with ignorance? Surely I spoke about things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. You said, listen now, and I will speak. When I question, you will inform me. I heard rumors about you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I take back my words and repent in dust and ashes. Now, let's make something really clear. The sins that Job's friends claimed him of doing is not what Job is repenting of here. Because Job is guilt-free. Job has none of those sins that he's talking about. But when God revealed to Job that his sin was a lack of understanding, that his sin was that he thought God to be unjust and thought God to be unrighteous and he gave in to his feelings. When Job understood that that was his sin, he repented of it. In heartbreaking sorrow, 
He understood before the Lord that he had wronged him. He understood that he had wronged the Lord. He repented. Meaning that he brought that sin before the Lord and said, I've done wrong in this way. I need forgiveness. I don't want to walk in this way anymore. I don't want to be this person anymore. And that same repentance is what you and I are called to. Yes, each and every one of us have failed a holy God and we have wronged a holy God. And the result of that wronging is death. The wages of sin is death is what the Bible tells us. But we can repent. We do not have to stay in the sin that we are in. We can repent of it. We can say, Lord, I have wronged you in this way. I've done this thing. I have watched this thing. I've said this thing. I am living in sin and I don't want to do that anymore. I'm sorry. Help me to walk in a different way. When we do that, we're blessed. Look at verse 12 of chapter 42. The Lord blessed the last part of Job's life more than the first. He owned 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 female donkeys. He also had seven sons and three daughters. He named his first daughter Jemima, his second Keziah, and his third Karenapuk. No women as beautiful as Job's daughters could be found in all the land, and their father granted them an inheritance with their brothers. Job lived 140 years after this and saw his children and their children to the fourth generation. Because of Job's repentance, he was blessed. Because Job repented of his sin, he was blessed. And you and I can receive blessing in repentance. Jesus says that we can come to him and whosoever calls upon his name shall be saved. The Son of God has come from heaven to earth to live a perfect life, to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins, to pay the price for our sins so we would not have to take the wrath of God so that we could be saved from our iniquities. Jesus came to do that for you. And he took upon the wrath of God on the cross so that you could be saved. What happens when we call upon his name? What happens when we humbly come before him and say, I have wronged you, I need your grace. From a true place of humility in our hearts, what happens, Jesus tells us, is that when we begin to follow him, we find abundant life. We find a fulfilling life. We find a satisfying life on this earth, unlike any sin that this world can provide. Not only that, but one day we will be home in eternity. One day we will see our God face to face and worship him for eternity. In a place, as we've already talked about, with no more grief, no more crying, no more pain, no more tears. I just want to read one more scripture to you. The latter half of Psalm 30, verse 5. Says, weeping may spend the night, but there is joy in the morning. The word I want to bring to you is that for those of us in Christ, our suffering will end. Those of us who are Christians, who have repented of our sin and believed in the name of Jesus wholeheartedly and followed him, we will be saved. We will be given life. Our suffering will end. So the question I want to ask you is, do you believe your suffering will end? Have you truly been to a place where you've come before the Lord in humility and asked for his grace? If you haven't, what are you waiting for? His free gift is available to you right now. If you would just call upon his name. For those of us who are in Christ, Take heart in that truth. Let me pray. Jesus, we just thank you for today. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you for the love that you show to us. And we thank you that, God, you've sent your son, Jesus. Father, you've sent your son, Jesus, into this world to save us from our sins. That if we would truly repent and believe, we would be saved. 
And I pray that each and every person in this video uh, would just know what, what sin they are wrestling with and know the repentance that is needed to be saved from it. I pray they would leave that life of sin and follow you. And find the life that they're looking for where it can truly be found. I lift these things up to you in Jesus' name. Amen.